Yeah, sure. Yeah, sure. So, so thanks, thanks, thanks for, for being here. here. Um, so, so first, uh, I'm going to give a, a bit of introduction to Rust. Um, the, because, well, we, we of course have, have some very important goals to, to achieve with Rust. And first of all, uh, aside from, from the, the memory safety promise that, that we get through Rust, uh, we, also we also hope that, that uh, Rust is able to uh, reduce the number of logic bugs as well as uh, reduce, reduce the, the number of mindless checks that, that the viewers have to go through that might not be uh, easily checkable by uh, other automated tools. And also uh, to, to simplify the work of driver authors so, so they don't have to uh, make, make, uh, think about more complex patterns. And uh, so there are a couple of things on the Rust side that can help with achieving these goals. For example, uh, replacing uh, manual, manual coding conventions by the compiler and force guardrails. So we, we essentially give, uh, give the users uh, an API that is hard to abuse or to misuse, and then they, 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 uh, they can easily uh, use, use the API without having any problems. Um, exactly designing robust APIs with uh, good types and yeah, hard, hard to misuse. And um, additionally, also having good documentation uh, is, is something that, that we strive for with Rust, because the kernel is, is famously uh, poorly documented and often, uh, often is said, like, just read the code because it documents itself. I don't know about that. Um, First, here's our, here's our outline, or here's my outline for the talk. Um, I'm going to introduce some, some Rust basics, then we go over in enums, because they, they are very great in Rust. The, the enums are one of the, one of the best uh, features. Then I'm going to talk about encapsulation. Um, that, that, that allows you to, to hide implementation details, unlike C, where essentially everything is public. And then I'm going to go over traits and uh, for, for further concepts, um, I might not have enough time for for the whole for, for the whole talk. So if if I run over, Miguel, just no, just stop me. And if any of you have any questions in the uh, throughout the talk, just feel free to ask them because uh, this yeah, is uh, designed to, to get you to to understand and learn Rust. And if uh, I'm I'm unable to to explain them to you, then just just ask the questions. Um, first, here we have some C code. I've decided for, for two different color schemes for, for C and Rust, so you can easily differentiate the two. And um, we, we, have like, we, have, we, have, we want to have a struct foo with an int value, and in Rust, you just declare it like this. You have the field name before the type. <coughs> and in, in Rust, we have something uh, where, we are, we are, where we are able to associate functions to a type. So we now have this, this uh, new function here, uh, which you also might have in the, in, on the C side, some, some constructor function. And um, we can call this function then with uh, foo colon colon new. And uh, this allows us to, to better uh, namespace the functions and, and associate functions that, that make sense for only one type to, to that type without having to, to prefix, for example, uh, this foo new or something like that. And uh, there's also an alternative way to uh, declare a, a, a struct. Um, this is uh, called the, the tuple struct syntax, where we don't have named fields, but rather the fields are uh, just uh, sorted by an by index. And uh, we use this when we only have uh, one field, for example, or, or fewer fields where, where it doesn't really make sense to, to give it a name. Um, we also have now the, the same function that we have in C. This foo value is now, now the, the value function here, and it takes this, um, this uh, ampersand self. This is uh, a reference and essentially the, the counterpoint to, to the, the C pointer, although references have uh, much more um, requirements on them. For, for example, they, are, they must point to uh, valid memory uh, and it must be dereferenceable, have to be aligned, and, and, and uh, more conditions for that. And then to access the, the single field that we have here, we just uh, use dot zero, and, and the field here is, is just has the name zero. Um, to call this function, um, we have the advantage that we, so since we impl this on foo, we can call it using the dot syntax here. So because we, 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 we take here the, the self parameter, uh, which is a, before we had 
just ampersand self, which is actually a, a shorthand for self colon uh, ampersand self, because this is very common to, to use. And uh, using self here is, is uh, highlighted uh, in, a, in a special color because it's a keyword. And um, this is the receiver type of, of this function. And this is what allows us to, to use this syntax. So this is essentially how, how people might, might recognize it as, as a, a method syntax from, from object-oriented pro, uh, programming languages. But in reality, this is just syntax. So it doesn't have to do anything with inheritance or, or, or any, any, really any of the other object-oriented stuff. It's just uh, using the syntax, which is very convenient if you associate uh, functions to data. Um, if you want to see if you want to see more, then I have included links to to the Rust book. So in this case here, this will lead you to one of the introductory chapters if you want to read more about Rust basics. Um, now to go to to enum, in enumerations. Um, if we start off with our enumeration in C, we have some driver state where we are either disabled or or active. And uh, we, we have a, a do work function where we take our state and maybe change it. And then we have this name function here. Um, it might not seem uh, very uh, obvious to, to take here a, a pointer to the enum in C, but I wanted to mirror the Rust side where we, where we do want to take a, a reference here. Um, and uh, here we just do a switch on, on the disabled and return the name of, of the current state. And uh, in the Rust side, we declare it in a similar fashion. We have enum state. We do have a different, different naming convention here to, to not use the, the screaming uh, snake case, but instead uh, just this case. And um, for, for the name function, instead of the switch, we, we're using the match statement in Rust, which essentially, essentially does the same, but, but is more powerful because it uh, is allowed to, to match arbitrary patterns, which, which are very important in Rust. So now, um, this th this looks, I would say, rather similar. And, and if you if you uh, just see that, like we have these arrows instead of uh, instead of colons and so on. Um, and also, you might you might notice we're returning a string here, but but there's no explicit return statement here. This is just because the last statement in in a block can also be an expression, and in this case, it's just a match match expression, and it returns the string here. So there's an implicit return statement which which we don't have on the C side. Um, <clears throat> now, if we want to introduce a new state to, to uh, our, our enum, um, then we, we can just add uh, in, in the C side. You have to add it in the, in the next variant because otherwise you will, you will mess up with the, uh, potentially with, with that active is now not value one, but value two. But in the Rust side, we can just insert it in the middle with a, without, uh, without problems. Now we, now we have added our waiting state. But, uh, let's imagine that we that we did update the do work function, but forgot the name function because it is somewhere else. And then in the C side, we, we implicitly now return unknown state, which is probably not what we want. Um, in the Rust side, we're going to get a compile error because the, the, the waiting state has not been covered in the, in the name function. So you're not able to, to forget uh, that if you, if you add a new state to, to your system uh, to, to handle it. Um, if we now add waiting here, then, then the compile error goes away. And in the C side, you, you, you might forget this uh, for, for different uh, enum matching, uh, for yeah, enum, enum matchings. Um, yes. Um, Rust enums also have uh, additional, addition, uh, an additional benefit, which uh, allows them to, to carry data. Um, for, if we add a reason for, for waiting in, in the C side, uh, so then we have to switch to a struct for the state have a, a state kind, which was our state from before, and a wait reason, for example. And uh, now we have the state kind, and if the, the kind is waiting, then, then you can use the wait reason to, to determine why we're waiting. And this is a bit problematic because you can also access the wait reason even if we're not waiting. Um, on the Rust side, however, this looks like this, where we have our wait reason uh, inside of the, of the waiting state. And you're only able to access the wait reason if, uh, if we are actually waiting. If we're disabled, we don't have access to, to this field. So if we now look at what we in, in do work, if we match our state here, then if it's uh, inactive and disabled, we don't have the, the reason field, but, but waiting, we, we actually do have access to it. 
And uh, lastly, I'm going to go over two, the two most important predefined enums from, from the Rust standard library. The first is uh, the option enum. This is, a, this is to uh, make a type nullable. So if, if you don't have an object of type T, then, then you can use option T and, and express it uh, by that. And as, as you have seen before, if you match an option, then, then you only get access to, to the value if there actually is a value. If you have none, then you have to, you have to check for that. Um, and also, there are a guaranteed optimization. So if we have a reference which is guaranteed non-null, um, then option of that reference is still pointer size because the, the non-variant can just take, take on the, uh, the, the zero bits. Um, the, the second most important enum or whatever is, is the result enum. We, we're using this for error handling. Um, and it has two variants, uh, OK and error. And again, uh, we can either have uh, the, the result that we, the, that, that we expected from the function or have an error returned. And we cannot forget to, to check the error because we, we, the compiler warns if, if, we have, if we forget to handle the error variant. And uh, if, you, if you're coming from C, then this might, be, it might feel similar to, to the error uh, Petra API because there you also can essentially encode two different values in, in, in one type. And if you want to read more, then, then you have some links here. Uh, are there any questions at the moment? All right. Um, next up is uh, encapsulation. And uh, this, is, uh, this is known in, in Rust as, as visibility. So if some piece of code is visible to, to some other piece of code, and everything is, is private by default, so uh, you're, not, you're not allowed to, to access uh, fields of a, a struct in a different module. Um, and you have to explicitly opt into exporting items using either pub for, for a global export or pub create to, to only allow the crate that you're currently in to access the item. Um, structs can only be constructed if you uh, have all, all fields are visible to, to, to the current module. So for example, if we have uh, a, a module uh, config in which we have this struct config where we have a public oh, size with a private name, name, then if we uh, have a different module that, that uses this, this module, then uh, we we cannot we cannot do this. This will this will be a compile error because the, the uh, name name field is private. Um, the way we we solve this in Rust, if we want to have a struct has, that has private fields and we still want to construct it outside, is if we we just create a, a public um, constructor function that uh, takes in all of the all of the fields that we want to set and then returns returns the value here. Note that this uh, this self here is a, a special type that uh, always refers to the current implemented type. So self in this case is a type ali alias of, of config. And here as well, we can, we can use self here to construct config. This is particularly useful if you want to then just rename the config and you don't, uh, don't for example, have access to an LSP, then you can just rename uh, config here without having to rename the, the field here. And also later, it, it will become more obvious why we actually need a, a self type. But now we can use this function instead of uh, using the direct uh, uh, construction method for, for structs, and uh, the error will go away, and then, then we have this. Also note that here, we, again, we're using the implicit return without a return statement. Um, with, with this uh, added visibility, we're now able to, to take a look at the new type pattern, which is uh, rather important to, to be able to uh, so we, we are wrapping an existing type uh, in a new struct with the, where the single field is, is private. And we explicitly choose which operations are exported because the, the field is private and you can't access it from outside. And we are also able to, to add new functions and methods to, to, this, uh, to this type, so it in, in, enhance the capabilities. So for example, if we, if we have a, a struct handle here, which, has, which exposes two operations like foo and bar, then uh, we can create an, a new type of this of this handle. So this is a private field because there's no pub before it here. And uh, we, we're, for example, only exposing the, the foo method and bar, we're not, we're, not, we're not exposing that. So you now can't call bar on this, on this type. Um, this might be useful if you want to have an opaque API where you return something and the user can only do something to, uh, to the value that, that you want to, to, to do it. So for example, if you, if you have, return 
some uh, file entries that, that you want to only the users only to, to write to, for example, then you can remove the read functionality using the new type pattern. And another thing, um, <clears throat> so yeah, here, here's the link if you want to read more. And uh, another thing that the new type pattern allows us to do is uh, mark data untrusted. So this is something that, that uh, came up at uh, our previous conference at uh, Cangrejos and um, Greg, uh, we, I discussed this with, with Greg. Um, we want to mark external data, so that is un untrusted from, from hardware, for example, or from, from user space, so that people don't use it to, to, uh, without validating the data first. Um, and we can use the new chart pattern in this case. We, we just have uh, a generic struct. So this T here means that we have, uh, yeah, that you can insert any type here, similar to, to uh, templates from C++. And then you have a pri the, pri the field here private, and we have no way to access the inner, inner value publicly. And we have a, a creation function for, for the value. And then we have something uh, that we have a validate function where we return a validated object here uh, of, or an error using the result type. And uh, this generic V here uh, is constrained by a trait, validate, which I will um, cover next what, what traits are. Um, and using this, we, we access the value here. So this is inside of the, the untrusted, so we can access the, the self.0 here, but outside, uh, no one is able to, to access the value. Um, if you want to take a closer look at, at the current patch set, it is, it is linked at five. But um, I haven't, I haven't uh, rewritten it yet to, to use this exact uh, yeah, way to do it. Um, and now to, to go over to traits. Uh, traits are uh, the, the way to define shared behavior in, in Rust. They uh, can be used to, to require that a generic type uh, offers a certain operation. So for example, our validate trait um, we want that every type that implements the trait um, ha exposes a, a function called validate, where which takes untrusted data, which is of the of the type t that we that we create here, and it returns the the type that is implementing it. So in this case, self does indeed uh, have a have a bit of a different meaning because it refers to the type that is implementing this trait, and <clears throat> maybe we 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 also allowed to fail validating this. So now if you want to implement a validate for, for your type, then you, for example, take, take uh, data from, from a, just a slice of U8. So this is referring to uh, just some amount of bytes in, in memory. And then um, you can, we, we can put all of our validation logic here. Reviewers will be able to, to scan for that and um, have, have our, our untrusted data marked in, in, in the code. Um, using using traits also uh, is, is done for, for different purposes. For example, there's the, the send trait from the standard library, which uh, is used to, to mark which types we can send between uh, different threads. Um, and also there's the, the sync trait, which, is, uh, which allows you to, to share data between the threads. And using those two, we can prevent that uh, locks are unlocked on the different threads that they were previously locked on. So the, these are also quite powerful, powerful tools. And for example, we use uh, traits also for um, instead of V tables, or rather turn traits into V tables to to put them in, into the C side, um, because they they allow to to bundle shared state or rather shared behavior in, into into a type. Um, <clears throat> then I, I still have some some further concepts that I want to I want to brush upon. Um, we have ownership on the on the Rust side that allows us to uh, only ensure that that values are used once, or rather, if we have ref counts that certain objects own a ref count, we can we can express that in, in Rust. Um, then there are lifetimes in borrowing, which means, for example, if we have an object that lives for a specific amount of time, the compiler is is able to to know that it lives for uh, for the the specified amount of time. And, and uh, uh, if, an ob if the object is used afterwards or after the object has died, then uh, the compiler will, will emit, a uh, emit a warning. Um, then we have uh, declarative and procedural macros, which are very powerful, but uh, probably difficult to, to go through in a 30-minute talk. 
um, but they they allow us to to extend uh, a lot of our functionality and and are very magical if you if you know about, if you learn about them for the first time. And then uh, we we have something in the in the kernel you often need that objects uh, have a stable address. For example, mutex, uh, mutexes. There is the the concept the concept of pinning in, in Rust to to facilitate that. And um, finally, we have a documentation that uh, we we, uh, we are able to put directly into the code uh, to uh, make it easier for people to understand uh, those things. Um, in addition, we also have examples in. Uh, in the documentation that are converted, converted to K-unit tests. tests. So uh, we ensure that our examples are not stale and, and uh, continue to compile as well as uh, enhance the, the documentation. So are there any questions about these topics? Hi, so I was going to ask about, uh, you know, uh, if there's any plan, like, you know, we can improve the readability of the Rust code for C developers, because for me, um, I'm a C developer, and I learned Rust actually last year, I would just say. So what I noticed is, like, it needs a very large amount of the time, um, you know, to ramp up, actually. So mostly, like, you know, I have to make careful notes, and, and if I didn't come back for one week, I totally forget what I learned from the last week. So there's a, um, a gap of ramping up. So what I was thinking is like, you know, is there any plan like, you know, we can keep a, you know, a boundary like, you know, on top of that boundary, we're trying to, you know, think of uh, readability for C developers so that, you know, they can easily understand what they are doing there. And, uh, you know, I think that would be much more helpful for people, you know, who don't have a lot of time to ramp up. Because for me, I, 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 I spent two weeks and then I finally start to understand, okay, what the code is doing and, you know, and then, then I start to write my own kernel modules, you know, doing all this magic thing. But I, I would just say, like, it's still a, a, a huge gap for ordinary C developers to really get into Rust, I would just say. Yeah, so that would be my first question. And the second question is like, you know, there's a lot of components actually reviewing the mailing list right now. So I was thinking like, is there, there any plan for the unit test, you know, or like, you know, Rust can do this by, by itself, like the compiler can generate all these unit tests by itself. Yeah, so that's my question, thanks. So, so, so uh, for, for the first one, I'm having a bit bit of difficulty exactly understanding where you're having difficulties with. So is it the syntax or is it just uh, the complexity of the language in, in general or where, uh, where are the Yeah, points? I think it's mostly the language grammar actually. And then after I manage that, I think he's fine. So I, 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 I can like write modules and uh, you know, know how to write all these bindings and expose whatever I need. And then I try to get deeper and you know, the Rust kernel memory allocator and all these things. So, but still there's a lot of um, magic macros in the Rust in Linux. I'm, I'm not totally knowing like what they're doing. So there's a huge gap there, right? So, and also like I noticed like when reviewing patches or patches checking, so like, uh, you know, there, there, there could be different way to write the code, right? So, but if you write it in a, you know, very like shiny and magic way, so it's super hard for people who don't have any background to understand. I yeah, go ahead. I just want to make a comment about the macros. I think you should approach them in the same way as you approach uh, C macros. They are magic and can be difficult to read and you sort of have to wrap your head around it. Good thing is like if you have a proper uh, editor set up, you can put your cursor on it and say expand and you can see what code it generates similar to C. So uh, I think that, that we can for example, have like a, a cheat sheet if you if you think that the, that would help. So, for example, writing how how you would write something in C and then have the the, the same the same piece essentially rewritten in, in Rust. How you would do that? But I think that that also has like certain things in in Rust. You 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 have certain things you only have in Rust. For example, pattern yeah, matching. Yeah, that, that's yeah, not something yeah, I agree. That you have in C. Yeah, because I really like so the, the, it, the yeah. Go ahead. Sorry. Oh. No, no. Go ahead. Yeah, because I really like the language. I would like to see it, you know, to be successful in the kernel, right? So I was just thinking from the, you know, from my own experience, actually. So, yeah. So I don't know. Have have you have you written uh, have you read the the Rust book or how do, how did you learn Rust? 
Uh, actually, I write, I, I, I uh, read the Rust book first, but you know, the, for each chapter, I have to make notes. So I notice, like you know, maybe many people have similar experience like me. Like you know, next week when you come back, or you are busy on something next week when you come back, you totally forget what you learned from the last week. So in the end, I decide I have to spend like at least one half hour per day and make notes, and then like I reach like the. The so nine chapter, and then after nine chapters, I start to really feel like, oh, I can read, I can write Rust code in the kernel like that. So that's the gap actually from my personal experience. Yeah. So because I, yeah, I, I was thinking like maybe, how to maybe, yeah go ahead. Maybe we want we also want people to to take notes because maybe that that helps the the learning process and, and not do that for them. I don't know. Maybe maybe it would also help to, to, to give them notes. But but in my experience, when when learning, it always uh, is better if you take your own notes, for example. Yeah, I was just thinking like how to you know attract C developers as well. I mean, at least let them understand what the you know what what, what the patches they're doing. I mean, so I mean, I, I I like the technology. I know you know what kind of problem is solved. It's really helpful. I would just say. So I was thinking like if you can you know if we can improve in marketing, I would just say, right. Uh, Thanks. I would say so. Don't, don't be afraid of in the beginning. Now that we don't have yet any Rust users, don't don't be afraid to to put code into the kernel, and make mistakes in the beginning. I think it's it's part of the experiment, part of the learning process that we all have to do. So I would encourage people to to yeah play play with it, and uh, that's how it comes. We have also ah. The, so you asked about unit tests. So I just want to quickly make a note that we have um, we have two kinds of tests. We have you can mark functions with tests, and then they're executed as host procs. So if you have stuff that's not tied into the kernel, you can run it on the host and test. We have uh, our all of our examples in the documentation are executed as kunit tests. So you can go make kunit or whatever the target is, uh, and if Rust is enabled, kunit is enabled. All of those are run as uh, kunits. Uh, we, we run a bit of a you know Rust doc for user space. That's that. So we have a something that David Gao was kind to take, uh, and we convert magically the, the, the examples into KUnit tests, and they run the, in the kernel. And for the other one that Andreas mentioned, we 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 plan to also run them in the kernel, so that you can also run you know call kernel APIs as well in those other kinds of tests. Uh, so so it's a work in progress those other ones, but it will it will be there. Uh, and we have a question from. The audience, can you? Uh, I don't see the name. Sorry, uh, Jenny. Uh, uh, can you please uh, turn on your camera and and speak? If uh, yeah, sure. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I'm yeah. starting the webcam. Uh, hello, Ben. Uh, thanks for your talk. Uh, I'm not a user of Rust, but uh, your talk seemed uh, interesting to me. So I would like to ask if Rust has uh, the concept of pointers. And if yes, uh, how can we relate it with? Um... So, so you're asking about uh, different kinds of pointers that that Rust has. Yes. Okay. So, so Rust has uh, se several different kinds of pointers. I already mentioned re references, but also, um, uh, for example, box for for data that you want to to keep alive indefinitely, because references are always tied to to the lifetime of, of the object. But with box, you store the, the data on the heap, for example. Um, but we in the kernel also have have other other kinds of smart pointers. For example, uh, arc is is uh, using the um, kernel ref count t to to ref count the, the value that that it has. So you're able to sh to share values uh, through, throughout the program using arc. Um, we also have a ref for uh, types that are reference counted on on the C side already, and that uh, you want to to reference directly. So um, we we have uh, many different kinds of pointers. If you do, you, do you want to know more, or does okay, that answer thanks. that question? Thanks. It's cleaning. Any other question? This is the chance to. Sorry. Any other question? This is the chance to uh, ask an expert on Rust. Uh, yeah, so uh, uh, you mentioned in multiple cases in your examples of the implicit return statement not being necessary. 
in uh, the code. Have you found, uh, in my personal experience, I've found that code tends to be harder to debug and harder to reason about. So I prefer to put explicit re uh, return statements. Have you found the same thing, or do you really like the implicit return statements? So I, I really like the, the implicit return statements when, when cr designing the slides, uh, because I rarely code in C. I forgot the return statement in C, because I think um, it, it, it makes it Essentially, it, it, it removes a bit of noise if you only have, for example, a, a single line that, that, that returns something. Um, then I think it, it helps. Um, in certain other cases, um, it, it, might, it, might be, it might be difficult to, to learn, for example, if, you, if you're starting out to see where, uh, where the return statement is. But um, if you have some experience with uh, functional languages, then I think it, it, it will, you already know about uh, implicit returns because there you rarely have return statements. I, th I don't think that, that it has uh, led to too many problems in, in the real world, for, for us at least. Uh, yep. Um, but, but also, I, I could imagine that, that if a subsystem really wants to, to have explicit returns, then I, I think uh, it, it wouldn't be a problem to, to allow them to have that. So I, I missed the beginning of the talk, so forgive me if you've already talked about this, but could you, could you go a little bit into how different kernel Rust is from STD and the, how different the tooling is? So like, does Clippy work? Do we use Cargo? How many of the like, so, core uh, types Clippy are we implemented? Yeah, Clip, Clippy works. Uh, we, we don't use Cargo. Um, I think if you, if you want to know more about the build system, you, you'd rather ask Miguel because I'm, I'm not an expert on that. But um, we're directly using, using Rust-C. Um, Rust, Rust Analyzer works uh, somewhat. So it, has, it has some problems detecting certain errors at the moment, but I think we have some people working on that. Um, but for example, auto-completion and jump to definition work also across different files. So that, 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 that's nice. Um, it has certain differences to, to standard or user, user space Rust because in user space, you, for example, you don't have any allocation errors. You just panic if, if there's not enough memory. And that, of course, is unacceptable for, for the kernel. So uh, we, have to, we have to use different, a different allocator trait. At the moment, we're in progress of, of, turn, of removing the, the normal allocator trait and writing our own because we also have, uh, have to put allocation flags to uh, to, to the different allocations, because that is also not, not uh, the standard, standard in, in user, user space. space. So uh, we, kernel Rust is quite different to, to, to user space Rust, but I think the, the same is true for C. You, you also have a very different style of C in, in the kernel compared to the user space. So, so I would say it's, it's very similar to, to, the, to those differences, because uh, we also have uh, many different uh, uh, smart pointer types uh, compared to, to uh, the user space, and, and also, also, for example, example mutexes uh, have to, because they have they to have, have a stable have address, address uh, they, they have to be initialized using, using the, the pinned init uh, mechanism, and uh, that, uh, that is also something that, that user space might, might not need to use, because mutex in, in the standard library of Rust is allowed to be moved around, so it does not have to have a stable address. So when you talk about the special mutex type, I assume that's wrapping the kernel's existing mutex type. Is there any scope yes. like, to eventually have Rust, like things like Rust-only mutexes? Mm, I, I don't I see, see why, why, why we would not do it, but, but for the moment, we, we use the stuff that is available from the C side. And sorry, one more thing. Um, could you, um, I guess the answer to this really is like, look at the code, but could you, as a cheat sheet, could you give some examples of cases where the need for failable allocations changes the API. Of, I assume that m there must be some core, like very common types that behave quite differently because of that. Is that true? Yeah. yeah well, well, if you if you allocate, yeah, you, you you get a result of, of the thing that you try to allocate instead of just getting the thing. So you just have to handle the the error. For example, just bubbling up using using the question mark operator you know, or something. Maybe we take, we take uh, one more. By the way, uh, Beno is going to be available, I think, right, Beno, on the hack rooms uh, during the conference in case you want uh, you know, to ask more questions or, or get help on something Rust related. 
also on the on the other days I will be I will be there. Um, yeah, following on from the, the previous question, how much of the, the Rust standard library is, is being used in the kernel versus how much are you finding you have to, to, to redesign it or, or roll your own um, implementations? Um, so, so as I said before, we're currently in, in progress of removing the, the standard alloc crate. So that is uh, the, the allocator, allocator stuff, stuff, for example, and also uh, certain and collections, collections that, that the allocator yeah. trait, uh, allocator um, uh, crate provides, for as example, for the vector, vector. Um, as well as, as the box type and so on. Um, instead, we, we have to roll our own in that case because we, we need the allocation flags uh, as well as uh, infallible, uh, rather fallible allocations because uh, the, the Rust version is optimized for, for the infallible case. There are some unstable features to enable uh, fa the fallible cases, but uh, those are not not uh, properly, or rather, those don't don't really work to, well together with with the vec type, for example, and our allocation flags. Um, but we are using the, the, the core, core library, so so essentially the uh, most trimmed down standard standard library version of, of Rust. We we don't even so we we never use the standard so STD, which which includes uh, a lot more for, uh, stuff. Um, but, but we did use alloc, or rather at the moment are still using alloc, but um, yeah, we, we're, not, we're not going to use it in the future. So we, we, have, to, we have to write quite, quite a lot of uh, new stuff for that. Yeah, yeah, I just want to add what, to what Beno said. So uh, we basically only use the core crate of the Rust library, and uh, we are also moving from using our own, uh, from the core crate, we are going, also going to move from the uh, using our own atomic implementation kernel. Yeah, for those that don't know, core is all the things that are not really depending on operating system allocations or anything like result, option, these kind of things are, are there. Okay, so thank you, Beno.